Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode here. Let's talk dispatch with me, the Raspy Dispatcher. Hope everyone's week is going good. Hope your mandatory overtime is low <laughs> and everyone's able to, to, you know, go out and do all the things as well as be, be superstars, rock stars at work. Um, I'm very excited to bring on uh, my next guest, she has a great name, by the way. <laughs> it's Ashley from Yavapai County Office of Emergency Management. Hi, Hi, Ashley. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am doing well. You have a wonderful name. <laughs> I know. Thank you. I like yours, too. <laughs> and I always sent the email. I was like, great name. So corny. But hey, you got to represent. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, can you tell me a little bit about your, uh, how you get started in safety, public safety in your journey? Um, good. I think I was like most other people. I just needed a job. Um, hey. I was 19 and I had just moved to Arizona from Wyoming and, um, my stepmom at the time worked for the county and she's like, apply for all the county jobs. So I did. Um, and my initial plan was to work for a couple of months and then go off to college to get a secondary English education degree. Um, but so I applied in April of 2011, didn't hear anything for months and months as per most people. Um, <laughs> and then it was April, 2012 that I finally got hired on and started. So a uh, full year later, um, wasn't planning on liking it, wasn't planning on staying. And then I stayed for almost a decade. So, you know, it's so funny. The more and more people I talk to, uh, the stumbling in the dispatch is so frequent. Um, and then the staying, like, Hey, yeah. I was, I was going to put one foot in and pop right back out. And then yep. all of a sudden I'm here 10 years later and <laughs> I'm talking to you on this, on this YouTube stream. So <laughs> crazy. Uh, what, what do you think it is about dispatching that made you stay? Um, I think it was the underlying theme of it was just being a part of something bigger than myself. I was a part of a mission and I was a part of this, this effort to help our community. Um, and then I was also an adrenaline junkie. So um, there, there was just something about it where, you know, you come into work and you pull so many traffic stops or you're, you're dealing with this critical incident or that. And there was just, I don't know, there was just like a, an appeal to it, I guess. Um, yeah. And I, I come from a family, you know, I've got a lot of nurses in my family. Yeah. So that wasn't quite my forte, but um, doing something that where I felt like I was making a difference. Um, but then kind of, I don't know, you, it's always something new there. You, you don't get bored. Um, yeah. I mean, well, there's, there's the downtimes, but <laughs> um, it was just cool. Yeah, no, there's, there's definitely a, uh, always, like you said, always something new, always something that I'm just like, huh, haven't heard that before, <laughs> you know, um, something's always going on mm -hmm. in the dispatch world. Um, one thing that, you know, I asked, I asked you to send me over kind of, you know, your bio, like your history, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, one thing I did want to talk to you about is uh, your journey establishing a tactical dispatch team. Um, I had a very short stint on my tactical dispatch team at my last agency because I, I lateraled, so I didn't get to, uh, be on it for very long, but, um, I find tactical dispatch to be so cool, so fun. Um, and I bet there's a lot of agencies out there who don't have it. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about starting one, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to do it. So what was your experience there? How did all that happen? And. Yeah. So um, it was 2015, and uh, we were working the Tenderfoot fire, which was the second Yarnell fire. Um, and I was sitting at my console, and we had a lieutenant down at mobile command at the incident command post doing dispatch stuff. And I'm like, why? Why is a lieutenant doing what I could be doing? Plus, I was always that nerd that was trying to do more, be more, like, I, I, I loved it. Like a dispatch nerd is the epitome of who I was. Um, <laughs> so I started um, harassing my poor captain and like, why don't we do a tactical dispatch team? Why can't we, you know, I'll go out there, I'll do this and it would be great. Um, and after about a year, um, so 2016, the summer we had another fire kickoff. He called me up on days off. He's like, here's your chance, go do it. 
So I rolled out to, to where the fire was and the rest they say is history. But, you know, so I think most tactical dispatch teams we see elsewhere in the country is really SWAT centric. Um, yeah. Our bread and butter really was with wildland fires and yeah. incident management teams because my previous agency, they have an internal IMT. So that was kind of the appeal. And our geography is wonky out here. We have a very large um, county and uh, we don't have the luxury, so to speak, to be able to have like hot channels or emergency channels or whatever. So um, I would go out there or other tactical dispatchers would go out there close to the scene. Um, we would run communications on a simplex so we can alleviate, alleviate or uh, alleviate, sorry, goodness, um, the main comm center of all that traffic because there's a mm. lot of to evacuations and fires and such. So um, it allowed that the main dispatch center to go back to normal operation, so to speak, because just because there's one emergency um, doesn't mean the rest of the county stops. Ain't that the truth. <laughs> that was kind of our introduction to it. And then eventually we were able to tag on to SWAT negotiations. And that was a little bit harder. Um, mm -hmm. But I think one of the cool things with the SWAT one was um, the one of the SWAT sergeants was actually one of the forest patrol sergeants. And he did a lot with fires and evacuations. So we had worked together in that regard. Um, but he was always very hesitant with allowing us with SWAT. Then he got into a shooting. He's like, well, why weren't you there? I'm like, <laughs> hey, um, now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that allowed us to integrate with them. And uh, it, it was a very cool process. And I'm very proud of it. Yeah, um, I definitely like our um, my last agency, our SWAT, our tactical dispatch definitely was very SWAT integrated. So I didn't even think about because I only did police so I don't even really think about the fire and medical side um so when you're out there like on a fire call and working the fire uh fire critical incident what is the tactile dispatcher kind of doing to support those in the in the field so we were law enforcement only too, um, okay. but we have uh, law enforcement manages the evacuation standpoint of it. The sheriff's mm -hmm. going to say, oh, we're evacuating such and such location. So it allowed us to, um, when they're doing the door-to-door the -door evacs or they're doing roving patrols um, or anything like that, we, we focus on that component of it. But the other side of it is that um, in Arizona, the sheriff has the um, he, sheriff offices throughout the state typically are the ones that pull the, the trigger for evacuations. So, um, and dispatchers were the ones that would send the emergency notification to the folks. Yes. So I could go out there to incident command, um, have the IC right there or someone else and tell me, uh, we had an iPad or my phone or whatever and say, okay, where's this evacuation? Give me the exact polygon of where I need to send this message. Um, because mm -hmm. that's, you know, these are the folks that in patrol, they know the roads, they know these areas. Um, I'm in a comm center and it's like, they're telling me, oh, just draw it here. I just draw it there. And I'm like, eh, why don't you just show me? Yeah. So that, that was a huge one um, was mm. the emergency notifications. Yeah. Very cool. I had to send, um, God, what are they called? Everbridge recently. Mm -hmm. I had to send like my first Everbridge because uh, at my last agency, the supervisors uh, were doing it. So I can't imagine having to send one for like an incident where you're in the middle of it. Like you, you see the flames you're trying to get trying to get the correct information out quickly mm -hmm. accurately to the right people when you're not trying to blast 400 people who don't need that message mm -hmm. um so i can only imagine how helpful having that tactical dispatcher on scene is in those Absolutely. in those moments yeah. for sure mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome um well, another thing, another great thing that I think, you know, reading about your experience and your history is for folks who are um, looking to get into dispatch and are trying to kind of figure out, like, what else um, can I do? Like, mm -hmm. what are the other avenues when considering an agency um, roads to other things, uh, such as tactical dispatch? Um, but you also um, have some experience with FBI crisis negotiations. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So it sounds way cooler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it does. I'm like, FBI, okay. <laughs> so um, the FBI down in Phoenix and the Phoenix Police Department um, put together this, this training. It's a week-long crisis negotiations training, um, but it, it's, it's a fantastic training. Um, 
I, I think any dispatcher that could ever um, train with their negotiations team is is huge because uh, it, quite honestly, I think there's so many situations that if we were to get someone on the phone, you know, we we're going to be that first kind of quasi negotiator. Yeah. Um, and we may not have the opportunity to pass this off to negotiators. So having some of those skills is just so huge. Um, and it was part of that, you know, initial integration with our SWAT negotiations and the agency recognizing that. And so I was able to attend that 40 hour course held by the, the FBI and Phoenix Police Department. Um, and so I just skill set to bring back to the comm center. Um, and it, it's basically the, the sense of it is just it's, it's all active listening. Um, and, it, and it's fantastic. And then you do kind of a scenario at the end where you get to see it all. You know, you obviously practice the skills that you just learned. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, that, that, that was that's it sounds way cooler than. <laughs> hey, I would put it on my resume like that, too. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do think you, you're totally true is that um, like I worked at a larger agency and I remember we've had instances where we have the barricaded subject calling in um, to dispatch and um, finding a way to connect them to the CNT officer in the field is risky, right? Because you don't want the call to drop. You don't want it to be disconnected. You, you're already building this rapport with this person. Mm -hmm. So the idea of having uh, a dispatcher who is trained uh, in that in that skill set is fascinating i definitely think we need to do more more yeah. of that certainly and what's interesting um to me is so when they're in that role and of course when you're you have negotiators on scene it's going to be a high caliber type of call like it yeah it really yeah. is but you know they have like the primary negotiator then they have a secondary negotiator that's kind of like the one that's like listening in and giving them little nuggets here and there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, dispatchers, we just got to roll with it. We don't have a secondary. <laughs> uh, we, we just I hope we don't miss something and we just, yeah. you know, keep going. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Just kind of thinking about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what would you, what advice would you give someone who's considering a career in dispatch, wanting to get involved in this? Mm -hmm. What is some advice you'd give them? Um, ooh, what advice <laughs> don't I have? It's, it's a great profession. Um, I, I think that's very evident by the number of people that we have that, you know, do stuff like this. You know, you're doing this, this YouTube show. There's other folks that just start up these training organizations. Um, and then there's people like me that just can't let go. Um, you know, it's, it's a very awesome profession and I definitely encourage it. But, um, you know, if, you decide you want to do it, you know, there, there's some rules, um, like establish healthy and strong stress management techniques early on. Um, I mean, it's hard for, I mean, everyone's going to tell you it, you're going to experience trauma. There's going to be some very hard calls that you experience, but until you're in that hot seat and you are taking that child, not breathing CPR in progress or shots fired, it, you don't know how you're going to respond psychologically or physiologically. Um, and so it's kind of hard to, know until you know um mm -hmm. but instilling stress management techniques is huge and a lot of classes talk about the i used to um so it's i used to go running i used to take pictures i used to do this and we start to lose ourselves in all of public safety not just dispatch mm -hmm. and so making sure you you find time for you um, which is hard because i mean some folks are, are working 16 8 hour shifts um 12s i mean even 12s on the low side is extremely hard to do yeah. Um, never mind all the mandatory overtime, the, the X, Y, and Z. There's so many things that make it very, very hard. But if you want to survive and thrive in this environment, um, you really need to instill some good stress management and have a good support network as best you can. Totally. I think one of those one of those early nuggets um, that I got during uh, my academy and everything like that from like dispatchers on the floor popping in and saying hi to us, us newbies um, is that, is that, you know, you're, you're going to get a tough call. Um, you won't know what it is until, until it's hit you. Um, and implementing early um, strategies, techniques, tools um, to avoid that burnout. 
yeah. you know, before before the buckets over overflow yeah. um, is very important. And it's something I definitely encourage uh, folks who are in, in the career already um, and those who are considering getting mm -hmm. into this career. Um, you know, I'm not here to paint this beautiful picture of dispatch that, you know, it's all rainbows and sunshine and we don't we don't have like just come don't worry about that mandatory overtime don't worry about that <laughs> like i try to paint a real realistic picture like this is an awesome job it's a wonderful career but the realities are you are exposed to trauma you you do it's a it's shift work it's 12 mm -hmm. it's long hour days force mandates etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. um so really having an understanding and a tool set coming into this so you can do the job long long term yeah. um, and really enjoy it, right? Yeah. And really mm -hmm. enjoy the job. Because I think if we do do that work, recognizing ourselves, not losing ourselves um, in this career, we're really going to enjoy it more. It's going to be Agreed. an even uh, happier experience in the role. Yeah, I apps. Yep, I agreed. <laughs> um, how do you feel that the job has changed you over the years as a, as a dispatcher? Um, <laughs> how hasn't it? So I, I started ultimately when I was 20 and I spent the entirety of my 20s working in dispatch. So I feel it almost um, kind of raised me in a way. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was, that's how I, I found out you know, what I, I liked, what I didn't like. And that time in my young adulthood where it's figuring things out, it was molded by working in, in, in a law enforcement dispatch center. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, yeah, there's the insomnia that's still here a year after leaving. <laughs> um, but I also 100% um, know that I would not be in the position I am right now if it wasn't for the experiences that I had in dispatch. I mean, looking at the tactical dispatch team, TAC, uh, TACOM is what exposed me to emergency management. And mm -hmm. that's how I even learned this was a, a world that I could explore. And that's why I pursued my education in emergency management. And here I am. Um, there, it just, yeah, I, I think it just provided a, a lot of skills and tools and techniques that I, I utilized in my professional life. Um, it taught me lessons in my personal life. And, mm -hmm. you know, anyone who ever says that, you know, I'm just a dispatcher, I can never do anything, but dispatcher doesn't translate to anything else. That's 100% BS. Yeah. Uh, it can be applied to so many different things. And quite honestly, you tell most normal people, um, I, I worked as a 911 dispatcher, that their jaws are going to drop and they're going to be like, mm -hmm. oh my God, how did you do that? Uh, so it's, yeah. How, how didn't it change me? I guess. <laughs> Certainly. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I most enjoy, um, about telling people like what I do is really giving them that realistic picture because, mm -hmm. you know, you tell them I'm a 911 dispatcher and they're just like, the craziest call you ever, you know, like they always want to go to the, like, what's the craziest mm -hmm. call. And I, I, my, my answer is like, you know, there's, there's just a lot more naked people in the world than, than we really realize. <laughs> you have no idea how many uh, people get really overheated and need, need fresh air mm -hmm. on limbs. We don't want to see, <laughs> um, but really getting people like a realistic idea about the job and, mm -hmm kind of spreading that knowledge and awareness um, to folks. You know, I really enjoy that. And I think that we're coming to a place in uh, public safety where dispatch is becoming more and more recognizable and more on the forefront when we think about first responders. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's a really exciting time uh, to be involved in the dispatch world. Absolutely. Yeah, no, for sure it's, um, it, it's hard but it's so worth it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the role that you're in currently, you said you left about a year ago um, mm -hmm. and, and went into this emergency management position. What does that look like for you um, in the role that you do currently for, for the county that you work in? I work normal hours, which is really weird. Oh, that is weird. <laughs> um, 
that <gasps> one is still I'm still struggling with that one the seven o'clock in the morning to five o'clock I mean it's a beautiful <sighs> ship yeah it, it, it's weird um, yeah but it, one of the first things that I kind of realized is you know the emergency operations center it, it's a that's one of the things that we do in like an emergency um, to support the response, but it's a logistics component. So it deals with resources. It also deals with information gathering and my brain just going over like, oh my God, this is like dispatch because that's exactly kind of what they do. They, they get information, they disseminate it. And then they also, when they call for resources, they're like, here we go. Um, so being able to kind of see some of those parallels um, was really kind of beneficial um, because my brain is, all dispatch and so how can I um, make sense of the world that I'm in now because it, it's not just dispatch I'm dealing with fire entities um, you know police entities medical um, the whole the whole enchilada um, mm -hmm. but it, it's been a, a really cool experience because um, I get to see more of the world than I think I saw in dispatch mm -hmm. you know it's it was very centered to my agency which makes sense I mean I'm dispatching for them um, but I get to deal more, uh, I see more people. So then there's a controlling of the face, um, which I have to learn to do. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I get to interact with the community and see them in a different light, um, you know, work with volunteers. I have meetings with fire chiefs, police chiefs, and work to figure out what kind of plans may work, um, work on training opportunities to, um, you know, cover emergency operation plans and such. And so, I feel like I, I get to do a bit more um, and interact with different people, which is just, it's really, really cool. And I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, no, it sounds, it sounds like an awesome, awesome, you know, next step or, you know, mm -hmm. something that uh, one, I just wrote an article uh, for Ryan. I just sent it to him today, actually, um, for 911 Training Institute mm -hmm. about, uh, like after dispatch, life after dispatch, like how to transition, like how to how to step mm -hmm. away. Um, and I think one of the interesting things that I'm finding, like the more I talk to people, the more I dive into the, the world's opportunities in dispatch is that, you know, folks are looking for what they can do next. Like how mm -hmm. can I take all of these amazing skills that I've acquired through this awesome career and, you know, do something else with it. Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes leaving dispatch is voluntary or involuntary, right? Mm -hmm. Either you would know it, we're it's time for us to go, we're retiring, we're looking for a new opportunity, or we take a tough call and, you know, and it, it's, it's like a torn ACL. That's why I wrote the article. It's like a torn ACL yeah. and you got to move on. Mm -hmm. um, and so helping people figure out these different avenues, these different uh, career paths, education to go get, um, especially degree. I didn't know there was degrees in emergency management. You know, I have two master's degrees in criminal. I thought criminal justice was it, yeah. you know, like that, that blank, it's a blanket degree that that's the only one available. Mm -hmm. So after I got my second master's degree, uh, I was like, man, I missed the boat. I should should have got it in emergency management, but I didn't know it was even right. an option, mm -hmm. which is insane to me. Like, mm -hmm. I just think we need to push, you know, the dispatcher and the avenues and the career options that branch off from mm -hmm. this world of dispatch. Oh, absolutely. And that's, you know, you never know like when, you know, those opportunities are going to come and, um, kind of random, but kind of not, uh, you know, a, a cool opportunity I had was, um, when I first came over to the office, um, the staff had a meeting with, um, one of the directors at the local college. She used to be a chief of police at one of the local municipalities. And, um, he, he was talking about, he also does a lot with like victim advocacy and, and domestic violence awareness and such. Um, so he was talking about this call from a dispatcher, um, that involved sexual assault and how the dispatcher, you know, got the information, was empathetic, and all the, you know, lovely adjectives. And I'm sitting there and listening to him, and I'm like, "That's my call. I took that." And it, it was several oh. years prior. Um, wow. And lo and behold, you know, they they took my call. Um, they 
re-recorded it so for you know privacy stuff but they use it in trainings throughout the nation um, wow. and so from that um i was able to get an opportunity to help with the dispatch academy at the local college and also work towards building a, a class at the college with this director and so you never know where um how connections are going to be made or when you're randomly going to hear about an audio you took years later yeah that's amazing but and talk yeah. about like just like i was just doing my job you know what i mean like yeah, i was doing exactly. my job i was connecting with this person who was going through this this trauma um mm -hmm. i was a year for her and now you know years later i'm like oh you're talking about me like thank you like that's that's so cool like i just find that to be so rewarding you know what i mean like mm -hmm. a, a pat on the back like that you're not asking for that like oh i am i i am doing my job right i'm helping people and not only did i help that caller now i'm helping people learn how to help more people yeah. and that's 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 such a cool such a cool thing yeah it is and i i feel like those little rewards are just like throughout this it not necessarily in that sense but when you you know that you you helped the the, the bad guy at the end of the call gets you know arrested or yeah. you know the, the child starts breathing or all these different things um you know sometimes we forget about in this job about the good that we do because mm -hmm. we deal with a lot of negative a lot of negative and yeah. there's a whole survival thing there but yeah. um you know being able to look back on your career and be like you know i did something good and mm -hmm. it's just it's it's a very cool feeling another reason why people should become dispatchers obviously yeah <laughs> it is i mean it's definitely that roller roller coaster effect right like you're going through a shift and you're going to get a call and it's going to be you know my baby's not breathing you handle that and the next call is like 911 what's your emergency oh i don't have an emergency but and you're like <laughs> you know it's these yeah. hard stops high rises low lows um but it is adrenaline and like you know i'll i'll talk about like oh i didn't get to breathe i didn't get to eat barely got to pee uh but yeah. i that was a fun shift like that was that was yeah. fun like i like going call to call and even though i might be complaining in between every key and mute um i'm enjoying it the whole time you know it's it's i think we live for those high paced um environments for sure as dispatchers yeah, yeah. it makes me miss it right there <laughs> and it's so and it's so funny uh when, when we think about like just the differences um in centers i came from a larger agency and now i'm in a smaller agency in, in the sense of call volume mm -hmm. and when i think about what i thought dispatching was um, in the scope of my previous agency. And then I come to my new agency and I'm like, whoa, we didn't do any of this yeah. back at my last agency. Like at my other agency, we didn't run people out because we had a Warren's channel that did that. Mm -hmm. And because we had a Warren's channel that did that, I didn't know what the Warren's channel did because it wasn't my job. It wasn't in my scope of practice. And then I come to a new agency and they're like, all right, we're going to run them out. And I'm like, looking at this other language of multiple hits and I'm like, what am I looking for? You know, and, and just learning just how each agency is just so different and the jobs the dispatchers do are so specific to that community and that department they're serving. Mm -hmm. And we have such an opportunity and ability, especially when we have laterals coming in to really learn from each other to make our centers and our situations better because the job can be done a hundred thousand different ways. And just for my lateraling, I was just like mind blown from mm -hmm. like how different it was. That's, that's the cool thing about this, this community in 911 is that it's exactly that it's a community mm -hmm. and you yeah, we do things all differently um, because like you said, it's dependent on the, the community, but being able to to ask each other for help and like, hey, what do you guys do for training on this? Or what's your policies, procedures on this? And being able to just share and collaborate is just one of the greatest things I think about this world because it's 
it's about having those those connections and those networks to be able to to survive and thrive and um it's just it's so cool no definitely and i mean just having the ability to connect with people mm -hmm. learn from each other you know even I had an officer come in she's like, yeah, I was looking at this other agency's tattoo policy and I took that and took their policy and looked at it and I've started writing up something for us. So for us mm -hmm. to update our policy, you know, really having our departments collaborate, patrol and dispatch collaborate, you know, and really get on both sides of the mic. Mm -hmm. It's only going to make the experience and, and relationships grow in these departments. Oh, absolutely. So you also have experience with um, critical incident stress management, mm -hmm. peer counseling. Mm -hmm. What does that what does that entail? What is your experience there? Um, so the CIS team um, at my agency, we I was the only one from support services um, dispatch. So the basically the civilian side, a um, bunch of folks from the jail, um, as well as law enforcement. And we would, after like officer involved shootings was probably the big one, um, we would get together and have a debrief of the situation and provide um, some coping techniques if necessary and kind of like a resource referral. So, hey, these are things that you might be experiencing after having this very crazy call that you just endured. Um, here are some kind of mechanisms and things that we recommend, like, you know, don't go get blackout drunk. Mm -hmm. um, maybe incorporate some exercise, stay hydrated, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. But then also being able to refer them to the EAP and resources as necessary. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, it was, I mean, it was good overall, um, but I think dispatch is still battling the idea of that they can be impacted by these situations as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I, I did that to myself for years and years. I'm like, don't do what I did um, for, you know, in, in many aspects of just like coping with it and minimizing it because like, well, I was just on the phone. I can't be impacted. These guys actually saw it or mm -hmm. um, you know, they experienced it more. And so allowing us and giving ourselves enough grace to be able to say, you know what, I took a crappy call and it deeply impacted me. Um, mm -hmm. and being okay with that, being okay with reaching out for help. So I think there's definitely, like, it was getting better. Um, I definitely saw on a grand scale, it's not something that's offered throughout the state. Um, and actually, it, so within the state of Arizona, they now have statute that requires law enforcement and fire. They have to be um, given so many, if they experience a traumatic situation, they have the, the agency or insurance or I'm probably misquoting it, but there's a statute um, stating mm -hmm. that they get counseling, they get mental health services. Dispatch That's awesome. Um, That's not awesome. Right. <laughs> but, uh, the same classification. We're not first responders. Exactly. Um, but my agency actually, they have a policy on it stating that if there is a situation where dispatch encounters that and it's job related, um, much like for the, our law enforcement counterparts, they will foot that bill. Um, and to equal what the statute requires. Um, and that was not something that was statewide. So I'm very thankful for my agency for doing that. Um, but it, you definitely start recognizing that there's, not everyone has that and that's that's unfortunate. So it was, I think, yeah. No, it's so true. And we recently in California got our bill passed, blanking on the, our bill name, but where we were recognized as first responders, dispatchers. Um, so I know that's still a fight all across the states. Um, and, you know, we're starting to feel a little more recognized, a little more in the same boats and the same um, understands, you know, we are more similar to patrol than we are to records. Um, and, you know, that needs to be acknowledged and verified all, all across the, right. the states. Um, especially especially when it comes to allowing access to those services yeah. because um, saying you need help is already hard, mm -hmm. right? Saying you need help is already hard. Now I'm struggling and I need to go find my own help yeah. um, when it would be 
a great uh, service for me to just have it there mm -hmm. from my department, from the place where I'm getting a lot of my trauma from <laughs> to provide, just provide those resources. And we definitely need that to be more accessible for dispatchers all across the board. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like it's one of those things like, we everyone has recruitment issues everyone's having retention issues and you know there's yeah. small things like that that may help i'm just saying but you know yeah you know just you, that's too logical stop stop with your logic that's crazy uh, but it's definitely something to consider right when you're considering mm -hmm. departments like yes um we all need a job like i had one one lady who uh messaging me and was like should I apply to this agency um, because they're severely understaffed and I know I'll know I'll get in the door and I'm like, okay, what? like, uh, you know, like that, that agency's struggling. Let's acknowledge that. Let's, and, but you got to be really committed to the struggle from day one and mm -hmm. that's going to impact your experience in this line of work not that we shouldn't go apply for agencies that don't have short staffing we should just be aware our yes. life our life situation what we are signing up for mm -hmm. because the worst thing i think for a department is that you get that person in the seat they've been told the realities hopefully they've been told the realities of the situation they're walking into mm -hmm. and then they act like I had no idea that we were short staffed and that I was going to be mandated and forced and this isn't fair and da da da, da. And it's like, we mm -hmm. talked about this, you know, we, yes. well, we talked about this and I imagine that can be super frustrating from the department side of things and a waste of time for the applicant as well. Um, we all got to get a paycheck, but if you're not going to be happy and right. acknowledge that as well. No, right? Absolutely. It's a struggle. It definitely is. Um, what, so what advice, uh, you know, what is one thing you would give to someone um, as, as we're wrapping this up, as we're, you know, something to provide them for their toolbox, for their tool belt? What is mm -hmm. that like one thing you wish someone would have told you earlier, sooner, um, something along those lines. Um, well, I, I think it's got to be um, take a proactive approach to your career. Don't wait for someone to come to you and be like, this is what we want for you, or this is the training we're sending you to. Take that um, proactive approach. I mean, because this is your job at the end of the day. It, it's We should have all that, that, that personal sense of responsibility and um, just that want our want for our reputation to be good uh that we we recognize oh you know maybe i don't know enough about my emergency notification system or maybe i don't know enough about cad to make me feel comfortable like feel like i'm deficient and seek those opportunities um to be better and you know go to trainings as, as best you can and put in for anything and everything even if you get denied for 19 out of 20 trainings and you get approved for that one then you've got that one shot you know to go out there and a couple of different things are going to happen when you have that is one, you are becoming a better dispatcher mm -hmm. for, you know, your community, because I'm a firm believer that you should have the mentality of be the dispatcher that you would want if you had to call 911 or your loved ones had to call 911. So you, you're elevating your ability to do the job. You're also going to bring back that information to your comm center and elevate your peers um, because it, you, you never want to be the person that hoards it just for a resume. You want to be the person that brings it back and help helps your comms center. So don't be that, you know, the, the hoarder. Um, but then also you're going to start networking. And networking is the single most important thing you can do at any job ever. Yes. Um, and so when you start having those contacts, you're going to have people, you know, for example, like radios. I, I speak enough of it, but I, I understand it. Um, I have a hard time. Like it's all in my brain and it makes sense, but sometimes regurgitating it can be difficult. But what's better is that I have contacts that I can call upon that are, are experts in this arena. And I know that I can have a conversation, understand their conversation and get help in that arena. Uh, same thing for like GIS. I, I'm not a GIS expert. I know enough to get by. But when I have more specific questions, I know who to call. Um, and it, it's about establishing that team and that network. And it may not be necessarily the team that's in the comm center. 
but it's a team of folks that you can call upon in general. So take a proactive approach to your career, um, get involved as best you can. And then the, uh, the other thing that is that you will start finding areas that you're passionate about. So maybe you're really passionate about uh, mapping and GIS and you can start specializing in that. And maybe that's a career path eventually. Um, and sometimes it's internally, sometimes it's externally. Same thing with radio or CAD or, or emergency management, whatever it may be. Um, it, it's just take a proactive approach and don't wait for someone to, to tell you. I think that is amazing. That's amazing nugget because um, I feel like I have recently started really taking that mindset and really trying to put that into my department, even, you know, my Rossby dispatcher stuff is really taking that proactive approach and reaching out rather than waiting to be reached out to. And the doors are just busting open. And I, I think that's great. And for, that's a great gem that you, that you've given us for sure. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody, that is our episode of Let's Talk Dispatch. Ashley, again, thank you so much for joining me today and leaving us with that gem. Be proactive in your careers. I love it. I think that's great, great advice for folks who are thinking about getting into this career, who are in this career, um, or even on the way out of this career, continue to be proactive. If you want to join me on Let's Talk Dispatch, make sure to hit me up. Go to raspydispatcher.com. There's a Let's Talk Dispatch tab. Jump on there. Pick a date and time that works for you. I'd love to talk to you. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, um, and, of course, subscribe on YouTube. And until next time, stay raspy, everybody.